Hi everyone and welcome to this tutorial video on Huffman coding. Today we are diving into a fascinating topic that lies at the heart of data compression and information theory. So let's explore how this ingenious method works and why it's so important in the world of data compression. In this tutorial we will begin by discussing the history and real world applications of Huffman coding. We will also talk about essential concepts like average code word length, prefix code, and compression. Then we will explore the process of creating Hoffman codes. In the next step, for those who want to learn more, I have included some exercises. And finally, I have created the Python and MATLAB codes and uploaded them to my GitHub repository. You can find the link in the description below. Back in 1951, David Hoffman took on a challenge of making binary source codes more efficient. He came up with something it called Hoffman coding in 1952. Basically, he sorted things out using a fancy binary tree based on probability. So what's a genius move? Giving shorter codes to the stuff that pops up the most. That way, when you decode it, there's no confusion, no extra bits to deal with. Alright, let's check out where Huffman coding comes in handy. You have probably heard of MP3s and JPEGs, right? Well, Huffman coding is the key technique used to compress audio and images, reducing file sizes while maintaining quality. It's like squeezing your files down so they take up less space on your phone or computer. But it's not only for music and photos. Have you ever noticed when you download something and it's all compressed? That's GZIP in action using Huffman coding to make those files smaller and easier to send or store. Even search engines get a boost from Huffman coding. It helps them sort through lots of data really fast so you get your search results faster than ever. It's like giving Google a turbo boost to find what you need super quickly. Let's observe a discrete information source. It produces symbols, but in our case it generates what we call super symbols, denoted as x1 through to xo. These super symbols are the basic units of information that we aim to encode and transmit. As the super symbols are generated, they pass through the encoder. Here, each super symbol is transformed into a corresponding code word. For example, super symbol X1 might be encoded into code word C1, and so on up to code word CL. The process of encoding ensures that each super symbol is represented by a unique code word. It's important to note that the length of these code words may vary. We denote the lengths as N1 through to NL. This variability in length allows us to achieve efficient encoding, where more frequently occurring super symbols may have shorter code words, while less frequent ones may have longer code words. We have a discrete information source consisting symbols of x1 through to xo, each associated with probabilities px1 through to pxo, and a corresponding codebook containing c1 through to co. The average code word length denoted as n bar can be calculated using the following summation that x represents the symbol and n represents the code word length. In this example, we have a table containing symbols aligned with their respective probabilities, code words, and code word lengths. The average code word length of this table is calculated like this using a formula that incorporates the probabilities of each symbol and their corresponding code word lengths. Here we have got a table displaying a prefix code. A prefix code is a method where no code starts like another. For example, in this table, 00 is not a prefix for any other code, and the same goes for 01. This guarantees that each message is decoded uniquely. However, it's important to note that while all prefix codes ensure unique decoding, not every uniquely decoded code is a prefix. Here we have an example. Take a look at these two tables. In table A, each code is unique and doesn't start like any other. This makes it a prefix and uniquely decodable code. In table B, it's a bit different. While it's still uniquely decodable, some codes start like others, so it's not a prefix code. A uniquely decodable code means that every message we encode has only one way to be understood. 
with no confusion. Here we are presented with another example where we aim to design a prefix code for a discrete information source consisting of symbols x1 through to x5. Our goal is to create code words with lengths 1, 2, 3, 4 and 4 for each symbol respectively. Let's look at how we create the prefix code using a tree diagram. We'll go through each step one by one. First, we start with an empty tree. Then we begin by assigning the shortest code word length 1 to first symbol x1. Next, we extend the tree with a new node for the second symbol x2 with a code word length of 2. Ensure that only one child node continues. Continue extending the tree for the third symbol x3 with a code word length of 3. Maintain the one child rule. Now, for the fourth and fifth symbols x4 and x5, assign code word lengths of 4. Follow the one child rule strictly. Ensure that each symbol has a unique code word maintaining the prefix property. That's it. Our prefix code is arranged to match the code word lengths we desire for each symbol while always following the one child rule. As you can see, the codes produced have varying lengths. They are what we call variable length codes, meaning they don't all have the same length. When we talk about compression, there are essentially two main types, lossless and lossy compression. With lossless compression, the restored data is exactly the same as the original. It compresses without losing any information. On the other hand, lossy compression sacrifices some data during compression. So the restored data isn't exactly like the original. Now we come to interesting discussion of Hoffman code design. Suppose a discrete information source consisting of symbols x1 through to x5. Our goal is to design Hoffman code for that. Let's consider the symbols line with their probabilities. We need to ensure that the symbols line with their probabilities are arranged in descending order. If they are not, we will need to rearrange them accordingly. First of all, we begin by considering two symbols with lower probabilities. One symbol is assigned the value 0, while the other is assigned 1. This assignment can be reversed as well. Then, we sum the probabilities of these two symbols together. For example, if we sum x4 and x5 with probabilities of 0.1h, the sum becomes 0.2. Since 0.2 is lower than other probabilities, it is placed at the end. The order of the remaining probabilities remains unchanged. In the next step, similar to previous one, we sum two symbols with lower probabilities together and assign them the values 0 and 1. For instance, if we sum 0.2 and 0.25, the sum is 0.45. Here we notice that the decreasing order rule isn't followed, so we place 0.45 at the beginning. After sorting the probabilities, the last two probabilities 0.25 and 0.3 are assigned the values 0 and 1 respectively and added together. The sum of these two is 0.55 which is higher than 0.45. Therefore, we sort it first, assign the two probabilities 0 and 1, and add them together. In the end, it is important to note that the sum of probabilities must be 1. Otherwise, we have made a mistake in the process. Now let's discuss how to interpret the code words. First, we examine the defined paths. To read the code word, we must read from right to left. For example, for the first symbol x1, we follow the path marked with a red line. Reading from right to left, we find the code word 00. Similarly, for x2, we observe that there are two code words, 0 and 1, along the path of x1. Reading from right to left, we obtain the code word 01. x3 follows a similar pattern with code words 1 and 0 along its path, resulting in the code 10. For x4, we encounter 110 along the path, giving us the code word 110. Likewise, X5, like X4, encounters code words 111 along its path. Reading from right to left, we obtain the code word 111. 
Finally, we notice that X4 and X5 have different codeword lengths compared to previous symbols. While the previous codewords had a length of 2, the codewords for these symbols have now increased to a length of 3. After designing the Huffman code, we can create the opposite table. This table contains symbols, probabilities, codewords, and their lengths. With this information, we can calculate the average codeword length and entropy. The average codeword length is determined by the following summation formula, which is calculated using the provided values. Similarly, entropy can be calculated using the following summation formula. As you can see, when the average codeword length is higher than entropy, it indicates that the code might still be optimal, but it's less common. Remember, the closer the average codeword length gets to the entropy, the more optimal the code becomes. Here we have an overview of the Hoffman code tree with symbols and probabilities. Now let's discuss the properties of Hoffman code. The first property is that codeword lengths are inversely ordered with their probabilities. For example, here symbol x1 has a higher probability than symbol x4, so the codeword length of x1 is equal to or less than x4. The second property is that the two longest codewords have the same length. For example, in this case, both 110 and 111 have a length of 3. Lastly, the two longest codewords differ only in the last bit and correspond to the two least likely symbols. As you can see, 110 and 111 differ only in their last bit. Now that you have become familiar with Hoffman code, I have two interesting problems to challenge you with. In the first problem, we are presented with a discrete information source consisting of symbols and their corresponding probabilities. Our objective is to devise a binary Hoffman code for this source. After that, we will determine the average code word length for this encoding, and finally, we'll find the ternary Hoffman code. The second problem is much more challenging and interesting than the first one. Let me discuss dummy symbols first. In Hoffman coding, sometimes we want to group symbols together to create our code tree. But if we are using groups of three symbols or more, and we don't have enough symbols to make complete groups, we face a problem. To solve this, we introduce what we call dummy symbols. These symbols have a probability of zero, meaning they don't actually represent any data. Instead, they're just there to fill in the gaps and help us to complete our tree. So, in simple terms, dummy symbols are like placeholders that ensure our tree is fully formed even if we don't have enough real symbols to fill it up. Well, we have got this discrete information source. First off, let's use k to denote number of mergers in Hoffman code tree structure. What's the relationship between k and the total number of source symbols? Finally, let's find the ternary Hoffman code for this discrete source. And if you want the answers, just ask for them in the comments. Now let's take a look at Python code. Firstly, let's understand how we represent a node in the Hoffman tree. Each node contains a symbol, its probability, and references to its left and right children forming a binary tree structure. In the second step, we construct the Hoffman tree. We start by creating nodes for each symbol and its chance of occurring. Then we continuously merge the two nodes with the lowest probabilities, creating a new parent node with the combined probability until we have merged all nodes into a single tree structure. Step 3 involves traversing the constructed tree. We perform a depth first traversal, assigning 0 to left edges and 1 to right edges, building the codeword for each symbol as we traverse down the tree. Finally, in step 4, we generate the Hoffman code. After traversing the tree and assigning codewords to each symbol, we have a mapping of symbols to their respective binary codes, achieving efficient compression based on their probabilities. And that's it! Thank you for watching our Hoffman coding tutorial! We have discussed everything from the basics to creating Hoffman codes. Don't forget to subscribe for more tech tips and tutorials and feel free to like and leave comments. Keep exploring and see you in the next videos.